Hi there and welcome from Ventura, California to today's webinar, UAS Mapping and Survey, Direct Georeferencing and LiDAR, sponsored by Aplanix Inside GNSS and Inside Unmanned Systems, and hosted by WebAttract, the leader in thought leadership webinars. I'm Lori Dearman, Senior Webinar Producer with WebAttract, and I'll be one of your moderators for today's session. And in just a moment, we'll be hearing from our panel of thought leaders as today's webinar is about hearing from these experts as they address the state of the art and science in direct georeferencing and LIDAR. Now, I'd like to turn today's webinar over to our moderator, General Jim Poss. General Poss is the Chief Executive Officer of ISR Ideas, an intelligence, unmanned aerial systems, and cyber warfare consulting firm. I want to thank General Poss for joining us again for today's event. General Poss? All right, next we're going to hear from a, a genuine expert and a, and a real user out there. Pierre Champonier has worked for over 10 years in the bush as a geologist on mineral exploration projects, mostly in Africa. Uh, he figured there had to be a better way than using paper and Garmin uh, maps to, uh, to sketch out where rocks were, so he familiarized himself with UAVs. He's now mapping rocks like a demon using yellow scan LIDAR. At Yellowscan, Pierre works LiDAR processing, training for end users, and after-sales services. So over to you, Pierre. Thank you for the introduction, General Poss, and um, hi to everyone out there. Um, okay, now that we've um, actually covered the theory, I just wanted to uh, give the audience a bit of an overview of uh, how it all comes together in, in the field. So for this last sort of section of the webinar, we'll be looking at the benefits of direct georeferencing, DG, for simultaneous LiDAR photogrammetry system versus traditional aerial triangulation systems. Um, first, just um, let me um, just introduce uh, a little bit the company, um, Yellowscan. Uh, since 2014, Yellowscan has been actually providing turnkey LiDAR for UAV to dozens of surveys like you all around the world. Our team um, is comprised with experts with more than 12 years of aerial survey experience together with geomatics applied research. Basically, our innovative solutions are designed for surveyors by surveyors. Our LiDAR solutions are ultra lightweight instruments, um, the most accurate in that category, robust, reliable and easy to use when you're in the field. The, um, one of the main um, question um, for U.S. operation is all about Part 107 compliancy as, um, as we've been debating. Well, our LiDAR system can be as light as 2.2 pounds, so that actually leaves you a fair bit of room to look at the UAV part of the equation, if you like. And when we spec out 2.2 pounds, that indeed includes the scanner, the GNSS inertial system, the onboard computer, and the battery. In short, everything you need to actually go out and survey an area. The yellow scan surveyor, just uh, displayed here to the bottom right, is armed with the APX-15 from Aplanix that Lewis um, showed earlier on one of his slides. It can't really go lighter than that with this consistent quality and reliability. So basically, just want to push the argument a little bit further. We've got good news for you, General Poss. Uh, first is that the yellow scan system can easily fit part one of seven. Actually, in France, the regulation is even more restrictive uh, in terms of um, in terms of UAV payload limits in certain urban scenarios. So the the restriction in France is about 17 pounds. And uh, well, guess what? We still go out there and fly and scan um, areas. The second is that we um, actually already have clients out there flying yellow scan systems successfully and acquiring data. So. The thing is sort of being pushed into a bit of a routine now on UAV platforms. If you want the point cloud to be colorized, not a problem. A camera, we can fit a camera, um, sync it to the LiDAR unit and record positional and angular values for each triggering event. This will make DG photogrammetry possible. And what more direct than actually seeing your point cloud displaying live as you fly. This is now actually possible with our live station software, uh, which an overview is sort of given on the slide here. The um, <clears throat> application that we've been um, dealing with so far are quite various. Um, some of the main ones are highlighted on this slide. And as you can tell, our core application um, looks at discretizing power lines, uh, like Lewis was mentioning, something you can't actually do with photogrammetry. 
mapping terrain covered with trees, unveiling structures or find topographical lineament features uh, underneath vegetated area. Basically, any application for which photogrammetry reaches its limit. But there is more to LiDAR than just its ability to actually penetrate vegetation, and this is what we'll um, look at in this presentation. The following sort of comparison experiment that we did um, in France was done on a 25-hectare quarry southeast um, of France, directly west of Monte Carlo, as you can see on the map. It's a quarry site that produces sand, gravel, um, construction material in general. As in other queries, the operator needs, uh, like what you refer to in the military application, a common operational picture. And um, this on a sort of monthly basis or quarterly basis. Um, this will generate progress report, volume calculation. Your operator will actually be able to plan infrastructure on that um, and other sort of derived product from these base maps. On the same day and under the same conditions, we had three surveying techniques deployed by various contractors. This included a terrestrial LIDAR scanner, a DJI Inspire, and a LS scan surveyor mounted in dual mode with an RGB camera, actually a Sony Alpha 6000 if you want the details. The aim was actually to compare the deliverables um, in terms of quality, but also to look at the operational constraints and timing. All techniques, uh, in terms of operational consideration, all techniques required initial survey setup. Before starting a survey, the tertiary LIDAR scanner requires a fair amount of work to actually establish control points for each site. The area triangulation on the other side um, relies on visual target control points that actually need to be laid out before you fly the survey and then needs to be picked up with a differential GPS, for example. The um, yellow scan system set up requires a base station set up on a landmark to actually enable the PPK process later. Otherwise, um, sometimes mine sites run their own base stations, so you can actually use that information and just start flying your drone whenever you come to the site. So there's even for the yellow scan setup, there's almost no need to do some pre-checks on the on the terrain. The survey process is far from autonomous with the terrestrial LiDAR system. It involves a lot of manual actions, uh, to scan stations of the stations, and so on. For the UAV platform, it's quite handy uh, and autonomous. Uh, the only difference between the, um, the sort of DJI platform and the, um, the yellow scan platform is that you need to, for the DJI platform, you have a flight, um, flat flight plan. For the yellow scan system, you need to do some adaptive terrain um, flight plans. In terms of, um, of timing now and, um, and how it all um, compares, um, the, the table actually specified the amount of time that was spent in the field, how much time was spent doing manual processing. Um, manual processing, I mean button clicking, uh, basically human intervention, and how much uh, time was required in terms of machine computing. You see that six hours of terrestrial LiDAR scanner um, surveying covered about one hectare at a GSD of one centimeter, while the LiDAR managed to cover 25 hectares in two hours to produce a point cloud at a GSD of five centimeters. The two products that you see on the photogrammetry column were generated from error triangulation process. The um, colorized point cloud was um, done with the 16 megapixel of the, the default camera on the DJI Inspire, and the other colorized point cloud, a 24 megapixel, was, was produced uh, from the Sony that was fitted on the um, LiDAR, the combo LiDAR configuration. As the table shows, um, the processing time of both of these resolution are quite different. The aerial triangulation um, process is quite hungry in terms of time. The takeaway from this slide is basically the productivity figures indicated with an arrow there. The LiDAR survey and processing is fast, and when combined with 
direct georeference photogrammetry, your colorized point cloud is only sort of minutes away. In terms of accuracy now, and what sort of accuracy you can achieve with those systems, seven target points um, were used and pre-installed for the photogrammetric aerial triangulation process. These were used as control point for the photogrammetry um, products. The LiDAR only required one landmark to actually set the base station on. An additional 27 ground truth points were picked up the day of the survey as validation point, true validation point. The box plot that you can see on the slide shows the dispersion of the vertical shift between the different product um, and produce point cloud product and the validation points. So all that explains the difference in Z. Looking at RMSC Z values, the LiDAR does a better job by about 15 mil compared to the photogrammetry aerial triangulation technique used. That's one point, but that's point by point, comparing only point, basically. If you look at larger area, so like patches of point, and we could do that because we had the TLS to actually validate a bigger area. Now, if you compare that, like for example, that 10 by 10 meter patch, um, which actually included a sort of a sharp slope changes, things look quite a little bit different. We extracted the TLS data uh, over this patch and used it as a reference point cloud. We extracted the exact same patch for the other data set and computed comparative statistics. The high resolution photogrammetry product seems to be providing a reliable picture of the patch, so does the LiDAR point cloud. The 16 megapixel camera uh, actually nicely illustrate the typical sort of trapping effect of photogrammetry point clouds of a sort of extruded object generating sharp slope changes. So the actual error on the um, 16 megapixel product is about 15, 15 centimeters basically, while the LiDAR produces a product like under five centimeter accurate looking at, again, a patch of ground instead of just point by point comparing. Now, in a more sort of qualitative manner, this snapshot sort of reiterate Lewis' presentation when using LiDAR in vegetated area. This is a portion of the mine site where you actually could pick up a few trees and uh, we're just looking at snapshot presenting the same sections between the photogrammetry and the LiDAR point cloud underlying ground changes can be sort of confidently mapped and trees profiles are quite described in a better way and a more reliable way with the LiDAR data set. In terms of infrastructure now, um, the snapshots are just comparing the two data sets in terms of photogrammetry and the LiDAR data sets and these images are quite self-explanatory. All objects seems to be sort of covered in a sheet while the LiDAR data set reveals the true geometry. Um, fine conveyor structures, as you can see on the images, they can be clearly described with the LiDAR, but they're almost sort of missed on the 16 megapixel um, data set. Now, in terms of another sort of last comparison snapshots on, on, slab, on sort of sharp slope changes, um, you you can see the three products that we were talking about, the two photogrammetric product and the LiDAR product. In the center, you can see the 16 megapixel photogrammetric um, product and you can still, on the profile section underneath, you can still see the sort of typical wavy profile of this uh, sort of data set with this kind of resolution. 24 megapixel camera point cloud uh, appears to actually nicely pick up the sharp slope changes generated by the, this was actually a bulk uh, bag storage, uh, but the actual um, edges of the bulk bags are picked up quite nicely. Uh, but this still gonna get some, some light conditions that will affect the product generating um, gaps of information. So as you can see on the um, left hand uh, image, you have all sorts of uh, dark patches that are actually no data um, 
areas, while on the right hand side, the LiDAR point cloud captures everything because LiDAR is an active process, so you don't actually need uh, you don't actually need so, like uh, light from the sun to actually um, to actually generate results. So that's one good point for the LiDAR. In and to to actually conclude a little bit um, this presentation and to give you the key sort of um, features, uh, we've seen how tedious the terrestrial uh, technique was to install and use. We've we've seen how important the size of the photogrammetric sensor was in parallel with the processing time required during the aerial triangulation process. Whatever the size of the camera, you'll always run into some light condition issues that we've actually picked up on a few areas in that query site. The LiDAR, on the other hand, uh, is quick to deploy, quick to produce accurate um, point cloud, and actually is a reliable tool uh, that you can fit on a lot of different platforms. And um, just to sort of sum up a little bit more uh, on the benefits of simultaneous acquisition versus aerial triangulation photogrammetry, well, basically you'll get faster survey time um, and faster processing time with a um, with with combo systems, um, but also all the benefits of remote sensing survey, which includes all the, um, the sort of safety aspect of remote sensing surveys, but also uh, not only you're getting this, but you're also getting all the benefits of doing a LiDAR survey. So that's all the, all the advantages of having an active light, uh, which will actually be able to capture even homogeneous surfaces like snow or sand featureless feature, featureless materials that will be hard to pick up with photogrammetry you'll also and Lewis pointed that one out it's actually the only tool at the moment that will capture fine infrastructure like power lines or other sort of conveyor structures um, just wanted to finish up with a few invitations um, we're running a, an international user conference um, in France, south of France actually, next to Montpellier on the 29th and 30th of June. Um, so if you want to know more about uh, the yellow scan solutions and to actually see them live, uh, just come and visit up on the website.